Okay, so now we've finally come at long at length here to the, uh, the, the my sort of intended subject of, of today's class, um, uh, which is sound. Um, so last class, in talking about what is poetry and how do we read poetry, I made the, the point that poetry differs a little bit from from uh, prose in that when we read poetry, we read poetry as a physical thing, okay? And one aspect of the physical thing is the way, the way that the words are laid out on the page, the shape of the words, um, you know, the, the stanzas, the lines, the space it uses, how that influences your reading. But another part of the physical nature of poetry that we pay attention to is the sound. Because, of course, sound is vibration, it's movement, it's a form in your mouth, uh, it's a form that goes through the air. And um, this, of course, has a strong emphasis on the patterning of, patterning of sound. Now, the contemporary poetry that we're mostly going to be reading will not use the full, may, might, it may or may not use the full range of devices that we learn about today. Um, and you certainly don't need to know everything that I'm going to tell you today. Um, but what I want to do is show you, give you an example, or, or, or at least introduce you to how, uh, to the words that we use to talk about sound, to analyze sound in a poem. So that it, if when you're reading your poem, you get the sense that sound is significant, and it often is, uh, if not always, um, these are some of the words that you might use in order to discuss that. All right. So the first thing that you guys, I'm sure, have learned uh, previously is about rhyme, okay? And I'm just and this, this is, I'm not going to spend too long on all this. I'm going to move quite quickly. So please take the notes down as I uh, as I go. So rhyme. To talk about rhyme, um, one of the things that we talk about is rhyme scheme. If there's a regular pattern of rhyme, uh, and this is how we do it. We find the first rhyming word. In this case, it's weary and dreary. Uh, which is, incidentally, um, sorry, I need to fix this a little bit. All right. Weary and dreary, which, incidentally, uh, also is in the inside of the, rhyme, inside of the line. And when you have rhyming words that go inside the line like that, we call that internal rhyme. So dreary and weary. Give that an A, because uh, it's the first rhyme. The second one we have is lore, which rhymes with door, and door again, and more. So we give that B for B, because it's the second rhyming word. The third set of rhyming words we have is napping, tapping, rapping, rapping, tapping. So we could look, if we want, at just we could look if we want at just the this is the end rhyme. Does that make any sense? I don't know. This is the end rhyme. We call it end rhyme because it comes at the end of the oops, that's clearly spelled wrong. All right, end rhyme. End rhyme because it comes at the end of the line, of course. So you could say of the end rhyme that the pattern is. A, B, well, we don't know what's the pattern yet, but the end, the, the, rhyme, the rhyme of this first stanza is A, B, C, B, B, B. End rhyme is the rhymes that come at the end of the lines. Um, so we have end rhyme and we have internal rhyme. I think more accurate for this one because I, I'll give you a hint, it does use internal rhyme a lot, so we're, we, instead we would talk more about, you know, something like A, A, B, C, 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 B, C, B, B, and that starts to get a bit complicated. Um, uh, one word that we need to know, of course, that I'm sure you already do know, is stanza. As you can see, we have this set apart from the next. That's a stanza. Stanza, somewhat equivalent to paragraph in, in prose. And you know it's a stanza if there is a blank space between. And that's it. So there's our first stanza. So let's take a look at our second stanza. 
Because often stanzas follow the same pattern of rhyme. So let's see if that's true. So here we have remember and December, A, A, internal rhyme as above. Then we have floor, Lenore, Lenore, evermore. Same pattern as above. The second line, the fourth line, the fifth line, and the sixth line. And then we have borrow, also in the middle here, morrow, sorrow. Okay? So the only difference in the C is that there's two up here and only one down here. There's, there's oh, there is sorrows, two. Yeah. Oh, there is two sorrows. You're still missing one. There's those four C's. Or there's five, five C's, C's up top and only four. Ah, there you go. So we have an extra one up here. Yeah. But you can see that it's roughly the same. So we could say, well, let's do one more. For the next one, we've got uncertain and curtain, before, door, door, and more. We're noticing the repetition here. These B rhymes are always the same sound. They're not just the same rhyme. I mean, it's actually the same sound itself. So lower, door, door, more, floor, Lenore, Lenore, evermore, before, door, door, more. So it's the same sound. And as you know, this is eventually going to become, quote the raven, nevermore. So that B rhyme is going to stay consistent in, in what its sound is. And of course, the C, so we've got beating, repeating, entreating, entreating. So if we ignored the, the double lines in the middle, we could say that the rhyme scheme here is A, A, B, C, 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 B, 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 A. That's kind of complicated. A, A, B, C, 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 B, 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 A. Now I would never remember that sequence of letters, but it certainly does give you the sense in the, in the, when you read the poem out loud of that repetition. You recognize that repetition. And so what you have is, you know, you have the B which, get, which, comes return, which gets returned to and the A which gets returned to. So there's this kind of cyclical thing that's going on with the rhyme scheme. And it continues. We can, we can keep going if we want, but we're not going to. So that's rhyme. Um, we have end rhyme. We have internal rhyme. We could talk more about um, whether it's rhyming with one syllable or two syllables, um, but you can look that up if you want. It's masculine rhyme and feminine rhyme, but it's not that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going I'm to leave it at that for now. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, it's a B. Sorry. I was. I, yeah, that's right. My my fault. Thank you. B B B B. So A A B C C C C B B B B. No, sorry, only three Bs. Three Bs. Man, I'm so messing this up. This is totally wrong. Let me try this again. All right. A, A, B, C, 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 B, C, B, B. There you go. There you go. A, A, B, C, C, C. B, C, B, B. That sounds better, doesn't it? Now, even, even just noticing it now, it actually sounds a bit more rhythmic. You know, you kind of see how there's like the set of three, a set of three, a set of two, and a set of two. I don't know. It sounds better to me. All right. So that's rhyme scheme. I think that probably you're not going to find a lot of rhyme scheme in the uh, contemporary poetry, because contemporary poetry has moved away from, from patterned rhyme like that, R from rhyme in general. Uh, gen it basically, there's this idea that rhyme sounds uh, sing-songy, it sounds cheap and childish, and almost none, almost no contemporary poetry, uh, at least, least of the books that I've given you, none of those books, at least, um, use rhyme. Certainly children's rhyme still does contemporary still, still does that. 
children's poetry still does that, and you know, cheesy, cheesy poetry does that. I'm sure. Um, you know, the kind of poetry that you'd read at a wedding or something. All right. Um, okay, sounds. But much more is going on in terms of sound here. What else do we have going on? Take a look at this. I love this line here. One of my favorite lines. And the silken, sad, uncertain, rustling of each purple curtain. So we have, we have a repetition of this S sound, and we have a repetition of the ER sound. So certain, purple, urtin. Okay? So we have two sets of repetition going on here. We've got repetition of a consonant sound and repetition of a vowel sound. Repetition of a consonant sound. is consonants. Now consonants, unlike rhyme, consonants is still used quite a bit in poetry. And repetition of a vowel sound is assonant. Now, poetry still uses a lot of a lot of a lot of consonants and assonants. I think that it's it's more subtle. It's more it's more nuanced. It, I think you know it, it just seems to me even I'm not sure if this is just a matter of the, the 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 fashion of the times, but I certainly find it a bit more pleasing. It's not quite so. It's like when when words rhyme, it's like you can almost hear them coming. You know, like my heart is about to break for you. I will always. Shake, ache, you know. Yeah. You know. All right. Um, but there's something else going on here as well. Well, one more thing I'm going to notice. You know, repetition, consonants of the of the S sound is really common. Okay. So S consonants is actually has its own special name. S consonants is called sibilance. Sibilance, so for example, in cartoons, when a snake talks, they always use lots of S sounds. They always have very sibilant speech. They hiss and they say, I so, I'm so surprised. Uh, you know, they say, they, <laughs> you know, because snakes hiss and, you know, and what do you call that? Like, why would a, why do they want to make the snakes have sibilant speech? Makes them sound evil, makes it more dramatic. And snakes sound like that anyways, right? So we figure, well, if the snakes hiss, then maybe they, they do that. And you know, there's this other thing going on here. Take a look at this. So here's sibilance, the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain. So what are we talking about here? What is this sound that he's, he's afraid of a sound. The silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with that fantastic terrors never felt before. This is the sound of what? I mean, yeah, but of what thing? A curtain, okay? What does a curtain sound like? Sad, uncertain. You know? Someone, someone make for me the sound of a curtain rustling. I'm hearing a lot of sibilance out there, right? So, if a, so, does a curtain does a curtain perhaps make an S sound? Kind of. Okay. So here we have the sound of the words of this physical thing of the words, which doesn't have to have any relationship to what they actually mean. Like the word stop doesn't sound like stopping, right? It doesn't have to sound. The word, the, the word red isn't itself red. But here we have these words which sound like the thing that they're talking about. 
There's a name for that. What do we call that? That's the word. When the sound matches the idea, I'm going to say the sense just because it, it, it sounds good if I say when the sound matches the sense. I'm using uh, consonants here. When the sound matches the sense, that is onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia. So obviously words like bing, bang, boom, but more interestingly, I think, examples like this. The silken, sad, uncertain rustling, okay? The murmur of doves in immemorial elms. Sounds like murmuring, okay? If you, ha if you have a, if you write a poem about a train and the, and the poem sounds like clickety-clack, then it's gonna be interesting. That's right. So onomatopoeia is not just bark, woof, bang, boom. That's one kind of onomatopoeia, yes, but it's also this more subtle, I would, I would argue more interesting kind of onomatopoeia, which sometimes, you know, some people will say it, they'll be like, hey, when he says this, like if I said this to some people, this line is actually trying to sound like the sound of a curtain. Some people would say, no, it's not. You're just making that up. That's just... You know, you don't know that he did that on purpose. And yeah, that's always kind of the case when it comes to this kind of onomatopoeia. You know, you make a case for it and maybe it'll be convincing and maybe it won't be convincing. <laughs> but I, I, I would say it works here. <laughs> All right. Um, one last thing. Oh, a couple, a couple more things. One, oh, another kind of, of repetition here. We have repetition of consonant, repetition of vowel sound. How about repeating the initial sound? Repetition of the initial sound. The initial sounds, you know, in close proximity, obviously. Equals what? So for example, um, a quaint and curious, weak and weary, okay? Weak and weary, quaint and curious, nodded, nearly napping. Rapping, tapping, well not rapping, okay? Um, surcease of sorrow, rare and radiant, silken sad, Entreating entrance. Okay, so I so you can you see that this is like done on purpose. Quaint and curious, uh, you know, Sorrow. quaint and curious. You know, you know, sudden. You know, yeah. it's repetition. Yeah, like quaint and curious, nodded, nearly napping, um, weak and weary, surcease of sorrow, rare and radiant. Clearly, there's a pattern going on there. Right. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> so repetition of the initial sounds. What do we call that? Alliteration is correct. It's alliteration. So he is using all of the above in this poem. Now, what I haven't got to, and we won't have time today, is rhythm. Um, and I'll just do it very briefly. Write this last, write this last thing down. The rhythm of this is called trochaic octameter. That's very simple. What it means is it goes ba, ba. Beat, two words. Beat, and then rest times eight. So, what is this? <laughs> that's all that is. So, maybe I'll talk about this more next time. Um, I want to give you guys your homework, which is to read an essay. Um, and I'm going to go run and get that. The bell's about to go. Please 
you can walk out when I hand you this essay. 